Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. In 2009, Ross Douthit, then not yet 30, became the youngest columnist in the history of the New York Times. Ross's books include Grand New Party, How Republicans Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream, and The Decadent Society, How We Became the Victims of Our Own Success. Ross's newest book, published just this year, The Deep Places, a memoir of illness and discovery. In 1994, still in her very early 20s, Kim Strassel graduated from college and immediately took a job with the Wall Street Journal. So there, Ross Douthit. <laughs> Since 2007, Kim has been writing the Potomac Watch column. Her books include The Intimidation Game, How the Left is Silencing Free Speech, and most recently, Resistance at All Costs, How Trump Haters Are Breaking America, close quote. Kim, Ross, thanks for joining us. I'm in Palo Alto. This is a fake background because I'm actually using a spare bedroom and it's just too embarrassing. Where are you? Kim, where are you? I am up in Alaska at my house in Alaska where I uh, split my time between here and the great Potomac area. Ross, you are in- I mean, I, I'm in my attic, which is in New Haven, Connecticut, which is almost as, as far from civilization as Alaska, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> farther on some reckonings ross but maybe we can come to that 2021 the year that was um i thought we would approach this conversation in the spirit of the unofficial motto of the new york daily news you had to have known some old time new york news hands to have heard this unofficial motto but i've always thought it summed up beautifully real journalism and here is what used to be the unofficial motto of the New York Daily News. Tell it to the McSweeney's, the Stuyvesants already know. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> okay, so in the spirit of that motto, I'm going to behave as a McSweeney and simply give you some of the big stories of the year. And the two of you hotshot journalists, since you were still in swaddling clothes, can tell me what it all means. So let's start here. President Biden, two quotations. Here's David Gergen on CNN this past April. Biden is off to an excellent start, arguably one of the best since Franklin D. Roosevelt. Here's an article in the Wall Street Journal just last week. Quote, voters are in a sour mood, short on confidence in President Biden. Some 46% of voters say, say they would continue Mr. Biden's policy course, while 48% say they'd rather return to the policies of Mr. Trump, close quote. What happened, Kim? Well, uh, wow, that's pretty remarkable, too, if you're thinking of just one year. But, I mean, look, some of this is just good old-fashioned basic political arrogance. Uh, they came in and heard all those quotes about being FDR and actually thought it might be true. Um, and you've had a party that, uh, while it campaigned on some of the things it's been doing, didn't recognize that most voters never heard that. They heard a, a guy who was coming to office who they thought would not be Donald Trump um, and who would uh, deal with COVID. Those were the two main promises. And instead, we've had this dramatic overreach. I think that's also been inspired and encouraged by this split you've seen in the Democratic Party and an ascendant progressive wing that views the takeover of Washington, uh, both the White House and Congress, as a once in a generation opportunity. And so they have pushed some extremely giant provisions that the American public just isn't ready for. But also, I think this has got to get thrown in because it gets mentioned less. Like people talk about that kind of overreach and they mm -hmm. talk about, um, you know, the split and the party progresses. But there has been some phenomenal mismanagement of this White House and this Congress, whether it's the Afghanistan withdrawal, which was just handled terribly, uh, whether it's been the failure of the White House to look at the economy and make some smart decisions about spending versus inflation, et cetera, but also Congress itself in this endless fight over this Biden legislation and two leaders, Schumer and Pelosi, who should know better, but don't seem to know where all of their caucus is, despite historically thin margins, um, and continue running their guys up this hill uh, where there's no place to go but to jump off. Ross. So, Ross, if if the argument is that Joe Biden was elected 
20% to pursue a progressive agenda and 80% simply not to be Donald Trump, to return the country to normal. The argument I think Kim is making in a way is that the administration got the proportions exactly reversed. Well, I mean, like, <clears throat> like most Alaskans, Kim is obsessed with inside the beltway politics, whereas us <laughs> salt of the earth Connecticut Yankees know that really the only thing anyone in America cared about in electing Joe Biden was the end of the pandemic. So it wasn't 20% or 80% progressive this versus not being Donald Trump that. It was all about COVID. And I really think it, just a huge share of Biden's troubles have to do with basically the Delta wave coming along and sort of overthrowing the White House's own confident expectations that the pandemic era was over. Um, now, I'm exaggerating a little bit for effect. I, I basically agree with a lot of Kim's critique of the Biden White House's thinking and, you know, how they how they've handled various things, um, including negotiations in D.C. But the the backdrop to that has been Biden declaring victory, basically, on July 4th over the pandemic, um, having the Delta wave come along and show that the pandemic wasn't in fact over. And then, you know, I mean, look, some of this is obviously beyond any president's control, which of course was not what Democrats were saying when Donald Trump was the president, but, but let's concede that some of it is beyond any president's control. But I also think that there's just been just a sort of deficit of creativity and flexibility in the Biden White House in sort of dealing with the shift that this, that sort of the return of the pandemic created, where in part, they should have, you know, followed some of Kim's advice, basically, and recalibrated their legislative agenda and said, all right, you know, if we're still in COVID time, we want to make sure that anything we're trying to pass, anything we're trying to push through Congress has something to do with, you know, something immediately to do with the state of the economy. Um, and so if the state of the economy is, you know, a situation where we have all kinds of problems with shipping and ports and these kinds of things, then we want whatever bill we're passing to be laser focused on that, that kind of thing. And that's obviously not what they've done. You know, there was some stuff in the infrastructure bill that you could argue was connected to that. But basically, they're just trying to pass sort of long term progressive bills in the midst of a very sort of immediate and ongoing you know, bizarre situation where the U.S. is sort of half in and half out of the COVID era. And, you know, I mean, it's tough to say exactly the kind of things that they should be doing, but they've sort of ended up with a default of, you know, we're going to return to masking and we're going to have a vaccine mandate that probably isn't constitutional and we aren't ever actually going to be able to enforce and I just think there were probably, you know, even on something like, you know, the rapid tests that everyone has been arguing about in the last two weeks, you know, we've, the United States has lagged way behind Western Europe in rolling out rapid testing, the, you know, something you can buy for a dollar in a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And there are regulatory reasons for that. And there are spending reasons for that. Um, but th there just hasn't been, there's been no moment when the Biden White House has seemed to say like, okay, you know, here's we're we're getting back on top of the pandemic, um, and I think that's that's hurt that's hurt hurt him a lot. And so is the fact. And then you can, then you can push at me, Peter. But no. you know, once once you went back into crisis mode, people noticed more the obvious reality that Joe Biden, you know, is okay. seems a bit too old for the job. So that's what I wanted. I think, yeah. Kim, Kim, and Kim, Here's who's that. sitting in Alaska, is the great is the insider here or paying attention to the inside. You've both said they should have done this, they should have done that. It's interesting to me, <clears throat> neither one of you said the president should have done this. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into that form of words, but Donald Trump, George W. Bush, go all the way back to my boss and hero, Ronald Reagan. You could argue about the extent to which they understood the details of this or that policy, but there was no doubt in the administration or outside it, that in each of those administrations, when the president wanted to have the last word, he had the last word. That fundamentally in, the president in the, was in the in the Trump administration, Peter. Oh yeah. Oh. Wow. They wanted to. They wanted to do things in Syria. Trump said no. When and they did, and then they did the them anyway behind his back. 
<laughs> I don't oh, know. really? Okay, okay. So, I mean, so, Trump, so, Trump wanted to pull out of Afghanistan, and it was Biden who did. I don't know. I just, I just, I think so the comparison I, I that, to but, Bush but, and Reagan just, is a little, just, a little just, more solid. Just okay. So I withdraw that because I'm simply trying to set up one question, and the question is, who's running things in that White House? Isn't okay, that a let question? Me, let me, I would have expected journalists to be all over that question. That you'd have had the Washington Post with one profile after Ron Klain, and he's got they, there'd have been charts. I remember a Time Magazine article in the early after in the beginning of the Reagan administration, and it was simply titled "The Troika," and it was a story on Jim Baker and Mike Deaver and Ed Meese and how they ran things. We don't, we don't seem to be getting that. Well, let me let me just try to bridge the the Peter Ross divide here. Um, uh, and in terms of who's actually running things, looks. I mean, there's always a different dynamic in White Houses. Sometimes you have trios of people. Sometimes you have stronger or weaker chiefs of staff. You know, sometimes Ross does make a point that. Uh, the Trump administration, there were people in agencies that were doing things that I doubt Donald Trump even knew was happening because right. he wasn't that kind of a micro focused person. Uh, I do think the entirely different dynamic that you're seeing with the Biden White House, and it goes back to that original comment about the extraordinary power right now, for better or worse, and whether legitimate or not, or necessary or not, of this ascendant progressive wing. You know, Joe Biden is not really running things so much as Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, or right. at least the sentiment that she represents. And I'm dying to see Joe Biden, like the real Joe Biden, please stand up. Uh, you know, he talks a lot about his negotiating skills and his time in the Senate. And, um, and, and he certainly has suggested this was why he won the primary. He was not Bernie Sanders. He said, you know, uh, this is the the uh, the rest of the party is striking back. I'm the guy who won because I wasn't him. Then immediately went to him and said, hey, let's break bread and you come up with all my policy positions. And increasingly, that has been what has happened is whatever the, the more extreme version of the progressive party says is what the White House adopts. So I think the real question is not so much a Ron Klain or uh, different department heads, or even Joe Biden himself. It's Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. Right. Okay, so so the question then is, I've got, here, here's the poll from the Wall Street Journal, same poll uh, about a week ago. Um, many voters now say they would back a Republican, more likely to back a Republican than a Democrat for Congress, 44 to 41%. All right, those numbers, it turns out that poll, the 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 generic Republican versus Democrat poll, are very powerfully predictive, as I understand it, in about the last decade or decade and a half of elections in the House. And Republicans, if they get up, if you get up a point or two, that's territory where you can have a blowout, 30, 40 seats in the House. All right. The point is simply this. Nancy Pelosi, an 80 plus year old Democrat, who grew up as the daughter of the mayor of Baltimore. She knows politics. Chuck Schumer knows politics. They know that they are facing, a year is a long time in politics, of course, but they know that they're facing a tremendous political danger next year. And yet they continue on this progressive path. How co I just don't understand. What are they thinking, Ross? They're thinking that the outcome of the election is baked in by economic trends and that the economic trends are likely to be bad and they're going to lose seats. So they might as well, this is their one chance to pass something. They might not have another, might not have unified control of government for five or 10 years. So they're thinking that, um, and they're thinking that if the economy turns around, if COVID goes away, then there'll be a recovery and no one will care exactly what happened in the negotiations over build back better. I think that's that's literally how they're how they're thinking about it. Kim, if I may paraphrase brother Ross, the Democrats in Congress are relying on the inattentiveness and confusion of the American electorate. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's it, except for that they're not going to win that game. I, I think it's more, as Ross said, I think he's got it completely right, which is that once in a generation opportunity is what they see. And they feel as though that's not what they're telling their members. It's interesting. The leaders are smarter than that. And they are saying, you've got to pass this 
uh, so that we don't lose the election. It's exact opposite. And I think somewhere deep in their hearts, they know those members that are still taking direction. I mean, look, really, this vote that Nancy Pelosi made her members take on the Build Back Better bill, she had promised them, I'll never make you vote for something that hasn't already been cleared in the Senate. I won't make you vote for a bunch of provisions that ultimately are not going to become law and are going to hurt you back in your centrist districts. She did it anyway. She's using them as cannon fodder. <laughs> um, but they're also agreeing to it. Um, and they know that they can't probably win this next year. And so instead, they're going to pull out any stop they can to make some of the most fundamental changes to American government and the system of American programs, entitlements, et cetera, that has been seen in this country for decades. Sort, sort of, except a lot of what they're doing will, you know, I mean, again, it remains to be seen. And I think there's still a chance that the bill just never passes. But a lot of what they're doing are these sort of, you know, one to two to these, you know, three to five year kind of gimmicks where you set up a program or you set up a funding stream for a program that states can opt into, which is what they're doing with universal pre-K. They're not actually setting up pre-K. They're setting up the idea that states can partner with the federal government. But guess what? The money goes away automatically in five years unless it's renewed. I mean, that, that to me, well, I mean, it will if, 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 I mean, one, you, you I, first of all, I think I think lots of, program that's been started that ever died. But it's not it's it's I mean, it, when when Obamacare passed, the Democrats expectation was that every state would go in for, for the Medicaid expansion. And that didn't happen immediately. And ev- it happened eventually because Obamacare itself survived and more states, more states went in for it. But that was a pre-existing program. Everybody understood how it worked. I, I think the idea that I mean, there, there's also huge design problems right now in some of these, some of the childcare stuff, where you end up doing as Obamacare did, sort of raising prices for middle class parents potentially. I think a lot of states are not. I think I would expect a, a minority of states would accept the money for these kind of programs, and then that puts Republicans in a position where they don't have to abolish a whole national program. They can say, oh, we're just cutting off funding to New York, California, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And I, yeah, I, I think it could, I think it could go away. And to me, that suggests that there isn't, there isn't any really central plan. And I'm contradicting myself a little because I just tried to give you a, a central plan, Peter. But some of it is just, you know, you have an unwieldy coalition everybody, nobody can give up on their idea. If the Democrats were smart, they would just collapse all the childcare stuff into a single child tax credit and call it a day. But, you know, nobody can give up the idea that, oh, we're going to have pre-K, we're going to have childcare, we're going to do these things. And so Pelosi and Schumer are in the position of trying to figure out a way to tell everyone who thinks they're in this once in a generation opportunity that they're getting what they want, when really they're getting like one sixth of a loaf that you know, Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell might might very well do away with some of it. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm a little more skeptical, but uh, but not willing to make a a, <clears throat> a detailed argument to express my skepticism. Um, but here's what: well, if you're right, but if you're right, then the Democrats yeah. should absolutely do it, right? Like if none of this well, ever so, goes away, so, then so they are to, making the right move, right? So here's what here's what I think you both agree on to one extent or another, and it's this interesting inversion we're told the press tells us over and over again that it's the the conservatives are always extreme conservatives or extreme right wingers in fact what you're saying is that all this notion that the political nelson polsby the great late political scientist well actually the house of representatives is close to the people you're always going to get pragmatic solutions no that's not happening at all what you're both saying is they're ideologues they're going to look they don't care if they lose they want to get this done correct i'd say 80 percent of the party is there yes okay. and then you have for instance those centrist members in the house or that's the term that uh, is often afforded them i would argue sometimes but uh, they're supposed to be the ones because they hail from districts where trump uh, won or narrowly lost are supposed to be more reflective of the public mood Um, but have also been told that uh, if they don't get along with this, and you know that these conversations are happening behind the scenes, that 
Uh, they will lose leadership support on other aspects uh, of their uh, work in Congress. And so, you know, Nancy Pelosi gets things done for a reason. She uh, is a, a rules with the, what is it? The woman with the iron fist and the Gucci glove, I think is what they, they say. And then you, you look, Look, I mean, it's remarkable. If you go back, we were talking about Obamacare, at least when Obamacare 10 years ago, there were a number of members uh, in the Senate, in the Democratic Party, who had to be bribed to come along. Remember the corn husker kickback? Remember the Louisiana purchase because you had Mary Landrieu? Those people have all lost their elections. It's down to a Joe Manchin. Um, and, you know, when he talks, the things he says, they're not crazy. They actually are the things that are on most people's minds. They are worried about inflation. They don't like budget gimmicks and bills, but he is a lone voice in the Democratic Party these days. All right, let's let's go to COVID. Um, first, a clip here. John Tierney writing in the City Journal, quote, we still have no convincing evidence that the lockdown saved lives, but lots of evidence that they have already cost lives and will prove deadlier in the long run than the virus itself, close quote. Jay Bhattacharya, how can we ensure that no such thing ever happens again? I mean, I, th I think the first thing that has to happen is that public health should apologize. The, uh, the, the public health establishment in the United States and the world has failed the public. All right, that's item two, item one of two. Kim and Ross, here's item two. Here's a quotation from Dr. Fauci in an interview late last month. Quote, when people criticize me, they're really criticizing science because I represent science. Close quote. As this year ends, what are we to make of the way public health officials and the administration handled COVID? Um, so on the one hand, I think public health officials handled COVID in many cases very badly. Um, on the other hand, since you started with the John Tierney quote, I don't, I don't think we know that that is correct. 800,000 800, people have died from COVID in the United uh, States. No, we don't and know that. Year, They've died and, with COVID, but we don't know of COVID. Even that statistic is still disputed, as I understand it. Yes, but in fact, excess mortality in I mean, I, I don't want to go down all the way down. No, no, excess mortality video. is a different. That's a, oh, Ex okay. That that one. Ex excess mortality has remained extremely high, for reasons that suggest that most of the people who are said to have died of COVID are actually dying of COVID. I not everyone shares that opinion, but that is that is my take on the numbers. I think the numbers are broadly accurate, are probably a slight undercount. That's a lot of people, um, and so I I mean, I I and I think the you know, the lockdowns, the, the debates that we're having now are debates in which the public health establishment continues to flail and fumble. There are debates over masking in schools where I don't think kids should be masked in schools. And they are in many blue states and many blue cities. I think that's a mistake. I, I mean, I think there's a very long list of mistakes that the public health establishment has made. But the premise, I, I, I would dispute the premise that overall, um, the public health establishment should say COVID was not as big a deal as we imagined it to be. I think COVID has been as big a deal as people imagined it to be at the start. Well, that's not quite, I want to press a little bit because that's not quite what John Tierney or Jay Bhattacharya says. I, I read the they're, Tierney they're, piece and I thought it was wrong. So oh, I, it is okay. what he was, it is, I do think it's what he was saying. I can't speak for, I can't speak for Jay. Um, he was talking about the I lockdowns. You, he, neither Jay nor nor John, as far as I can tell, so I, was I saying think, that it was so, a, they were saying the lockdowns. That we don't have evidence the lockdowns. Sorry, I won't go on and on, but we don't have I mean, evidence I, the I, lockdowns so did any good. You just, you just I don't think that. we have convincing evidence one way or another about the efficacy of the lockdowns. I think the lockdowns were not the grave mistake of public of the public health establishment. The lockdowns were a temporary measure that basically in the U.S. were done by the summer. I mean, we haven't had anything that could be reasonably called a lockdown in the United States generally, especially not in, you know, in most of the country, maybe in a, you could argue that some restrictions in a few liberal cities fit the bill. The, I think the mistakes the public health establishment have made have been around communication, 
um, you know, sort of the, the stuff you got with the Fauci quote, the idea that anything the establishment says counts as science and anyone who doubts it is against science, that's all rubbish and ridiculous. Um, a lot of the emphasis on masking kids is, has been terrible and sort of the continued, you know, the, 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 yeah, the sort of continued sort of swings back and forth in public messaging where you're sort of encouraging this kind of this mood of constant panic, even once you actually, even once you have vaccines, all of that's been bad. Um, but I'm just, I'm just here to say, I, I think COVID's been really, really bad. And I'm, okay. I, Co- I'm sorry, one more question then over to Kim. So <laughs> yeah. evidence mixed on whether the lockdowns were efficacious or not. A uh, bad messaging and a certain what arrogance, I don't know, I don't want to mischaracterize you, but ba- bad messaging on the part of public health officials. What did they get right? I think it's an arrogance, arrogance sort of, well, I think the fundamental, the, the core mistake that runs through the entire public health response has been the need to act as if you have this sort of scientific certainty oh. when you're actually in a fluid, fast moving situation with a novel disease that nobody fully understands. God. And so then when you have to change your guidance, people are understandably confused and baffled by why you acted like you had all this certainty at the beginning. If the, if the public health officials had come out at the beginning and said, we don't know what's going on, everything we're doing is precautionary because we don't know how bad this thing could get, that would have been a lot more, a lot more reasonable. And that has been, I think, a problem, a problem throughout. And now you do have a sort of persistence in more liberal parts of America of, I think, unreasonable COVID theater that, you know, like some of the stuff that went into place after 9-11, maybe with us for years or decades even. Um, And that I think is quite bad. Kim? Well, let me just by comparison, first off, say all the people that got everything right, because the contrast between the public health official establishment and elements of the federal government is so profound. Most Americans, at least in the past year, got everything right in that, and I'm talking about those who did go and get vaccinated, okay? If you want to deal with this problem, my colleague Holman Jenkins had the number, and this is a very rough estimates, but if you had an unvaccinated person and you made the comparison between the flu or COVID, COVID was about twice as deadly. It was it was really bad. I mean, it was bad and, and more so obviously for older Americans. Um, But people went and got the vaccine. And when you are vaccinated, actually, for most Americans, the risk to them uh, as a vaccinated person uh, coming in contact with COVID is less than that of the flu. So if you want to get the country back on the path to normal, most Americans who went and got their vaccinations, they did that. Pharmaceutical industry has been amazing, not just in terms of creating that vaccine, but also the recent therapeutics has been coming out with Mm -hmm. business community, extraordinarily nimble, dealing with some of these supply chain challenges, um, et cetera. Uh, And some governors and local jurisdictions who understood what experts were telling us, even at the beginning of this year, that at some point this was going to become an endemic disease is going to be around and we were going to have to figure out how to get on with it. It's a public health establishment. I mean, I can't think of anything that it actually got right other than making the consistent argument that you should go and get vaccinated. But they were wrong on lockdowns. They were wrong on masking. They were wrong on social distancing. None of it, by the way, the states that did it more aggressively versus the states that did it not at all. There has been no difference in who got waves uh, and when they came um, or the severity that we know that that just simply doesn't work. Uh, They got it wrong on schools. They listened to teachers unions as part of the uh, information they made to decide to lock down kids and, and, and deny them an entire year of schooling. They've been wrong on economic questions and in particular not balancing the economic questions that go into this, which have also had huge ramifications for public health. If you're going to shut down all kinds of things, people are not going to go get preventive care. We're beginning to see the consequences of this now. So yeah, they they got mostly everything wrong. Shifting guidance. It's just, I can't think of a, a high point. Kim, you wrote in the journal earlier this month, earlier this month of December, the Biden administration at some point will realize that its political fortunes are tied to a virus that isn't going anywhere. Well, you know, to go to, to Ross's point about the fundamental error of Democrats, I agree that a huge amount of this has been about Joe Biden spiking the football in July. But that arrogance goes back to last summer. I remember being stunned when I first started seeing Democrats saying Donald Trump should be controlling this virus. And the fact that he isn't is a reason why he should not be reelected. 
No politician can control a virus. And that was Joe Biden's campaign message. Put me in office and I'll make this go away. Even as the experts were explaining that it wasn't likely to ever go away. So now every single time they say, well, look, we'll just do this one more thing and it'll make it all better. Um, I don't have a lot of sympathy because this was something that just an obvious person even a year ago knew was bad politics. Hoist by their own petard, which I honestly have never understood what a petard was in the first place. But, <laughs> so Ross, so should the administration somehow or other dissociate itself from declare victory somehow or other we have the vaccines we're learning to live with it and move on could they do how should the administration behave at this stage i mean i think it is the challenge for the administration is in part they are part of a political coalition that includes both the public health establishment and um you know a sort of a culture of of sort of permanent theater and and fear as a response to the disease that's part of their coalition and there's sort of limits in clearly there seem to be limits to how far they can go in challenging that at the same time i don't i don't fully agree with kim i mean i think just the fact that vaccines do work against the disease means that there is something that public health can do about the disease there is something that the Biden administration can do about the disease. And I don't think that that something is a national vaccine mandate. But for instance, the Biden White House was very slow to authorize booster shots uh, that now, you know, do now seem like, you know, for people who haven't had COVID, um, pretty are, good idea. Are, are probably a good idea, especially mm -hmm. older people who are, you know, who sort of most likely to be vulnerable to the, to the disease, right? And this was a case where, you know, the, the critique of the public health establishment held because the public health establishment wasn't sure about authorizing them. Um, and the Biden White House sort of half overruled them, but didn't completely overrule them. And there was mixed messaging for a long period of time. And the upshot is that the U.S. is behind Israel and the United Kingdom and a bunch of other places in, in booster in booster uptake. Um, so that's that would be a concrete example of something where I think that they could have gotten out ahead of the new wave a little bit. Um, and there are there are limits, but there are there are still things that you can do in public policy um, to increase vaccination rates and thereby hasten the period when there, I guess I'd say there's just, there are a lot of different ways for a disease to be endemic. Right now with the number of deaths that we're having from COVID, endemic COVID means something still a lot worse than the flu. And that's, and that will change as more people are vaccinated and more people have prior immunity, but we aren't to a level where it's just like the flu yet. And that's a problem for the administration. It's a problem even because even, even in economic terms, it like it, you know, one of the reasons that we have as much inflation as we do is that people are still consuming goods rather than services. They're buying things on Amazon instead of going out to dinner and going on vacation because they're still reacting to the disease, even if they aren't living in fear of it in the day to day. And that that change would make a big difference for the economy if people were spending money on a family vacation more than, you know, ordering six more things to go through the port of Los Angeles. I'm personal anecdote. We went, my family and I went to see West Side Story last night in a theater. They gave it, it was the multiplex, but they gave it the big theater, the big theater, 300 seats for 300. There were 12 people in the theater for the big holiday release, which is opening to sensational reviews, 12 people in the theater. Um, yeah, older older people are not going back to the movie theaters, as far as anyone can tell. The only movies that are doing well, and I mean, this was there was a pre existing pattern here, but the divergence is sharp. The movies that are doing well are just, for the most part, movies pitched to younger people, and you you have not gotten people who would normally go to see the big Oscar nominees back into theaters yet. Hmm. China, The Economist magazine, this past March, China is increasingly sure that America is in long-term irreversible decline. China is now applying calculated doses of pain to shock Westerners into realizing that, that the old American-led order is ending." Close quote. Is it, Kim? <laughs> well, I'm sure that China 
hopes it is, and is certainly taking actions uh, in the belief or hope that it is. I, I also think, though, that when you look at what China is doing, and yes, we should be very concerned about what China is doing, not just its aggressive posture uh, increasingly in the region, uh, but also its attacks on us, whether that be through cyber attacks or whether it's patent theft of companies that work in our area, uh, or whether or not it's, for instance, the fact that China continues to buy oil from Iran in direct violation of U.S. sanctions. Uh, it's, it's increasingly acting in a hostile way. But I think the scary thing is you have to ask yourself why. And the reality is, I mean, you could make the easy argument that it's because it's a reaction the United States are taking an opportunity that it thinks will hurt its biggest super rival. But this is also internal dynamics in China. And that is what's a little bit more scary is that, you know, for decades now, the West has operated under this belief model that the Chinese were attempting to do this hybrid where it allowed a certain level of free market engagement. Uh, we took them up on that deal because we figured it was a way to introduce their people to democracy, free market ideas. There's a, a pushback against that. Xi is clearly worried. Um, he's stepping away from that. Um, I think that also the economic problems that the rest of the world's been facing, one way that you deal with it when you have more of a, uh, a, a, a an authoritarian regime is you try to divert everyone's attention away from their sorrows. You do that by raising nationalistic flags and saying, we're going to, you know, Taiwan is ours, Hong Kong is ours. Um, and, and those kind of dynamics, I think, are more frightening because it isn't really so much a reaction to us. It's, it's bigger sea changes happening within China that could have long term ramifications. Mm. So this is who was it, it was. And I think this is a Kissinger point. I'm going way back to when the Cold War was still taking place. But the Kissinger's point, it was either Kissinger. Or it doesn't matter. It was a point that smart people made that absent our containment. When we played nice with the Soviets because of Soviet internal dynamics, they had no choice but to push against us. If we retreated, they would advance because of their internal dynamic, the dynamics of their internal politics. That's the argument, roughly. Yeah, that's absolutely my argument. And, you know, I think, by the way, too, if China senses something about the United States, it's not necessarily, at least not yet, some fundamental sign of decline or retreat or change so much as a belief that at least the current occupant of the White House is not willing to check their behavior in any way. Okay. So, Ross, still on China, but if I may uh, set up a slightly different question. Neil Ferguson wrote a piece this year that I found more than striking, I found frightening. And he said, hmm, it looks to me, Neil Ferguson, known to both of you, historian, um, Neil said, it looks to me as though Taiwan could be the American Suez. And of course, Suez, 1956, the British organized for the French and the Israelis to go in and recapture the Suez Canal from Nasser, and then the British come in on their side, and it all falls apart. And that is the moment when what was left of the British Empire simply disintegrates. All right. So I thought, that's very arresting, but still off in the who knows when future. Item one, item two of two. Then I came across this report. This is Reuters. This is a news report. Dateline Taipei, this is about two months ago. China sent more fighter jets into Taiwan's air defense zone on Wednesday in a stepped up show of force around the island Beijing claims as its own. And Taiwan's foreign minister said it would fight to the end if China attacks. Taiwan's defense ministry said 15 Chinese aircraft, including 12 fighters, entered its air defense identification zone with an anti-submarine aircraft flying to the south through the Bashi Channel between Taiwan and the Philippines. This is very serious. This is very serious with the Chinese engaging in repeated violations of Taiwanese airspace and the Taiwan defense minister saying, we'll fight to the end. Ross? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm maybe a little more pessimistic than Kim. I, I agree with her general analysis of the internal Chinese situation. Um, but look, I mean, American American power has declined, relatively speaking, um, over, the, over the last 15 or 20 years. Chinese power has increased. China, Chinese technological proficiency 
has pretty obviously increased. And, you know, when China looks at us, on the one hand, on the left, they see basically, you know, sort of a woke progressivism that um, they like to mock <laughs> and that they think represents a sort of, you know, a kind of in, in internally di directed self-hatred characteristic of an empire in decline. Um, but then also on the right, you know, we were just having this conversation about, um, you know, sort of the impossibility of controlling a virus. China doesn't think it's impossible to control a virus. China looks at the U.S. and says, you know, we we the, we controlled it and you guys you guys didn't. China has put out, you know, propaganda videos. I've seen them contrasting their successful coronavirus response to our flailing and unsuccessful one. So they they think that both the American right, they think the American right and the American left are unready to, you know, for what it would actually take to defend Taiwan. So I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's a very dangerous situation. And I, I think that, um, I don't think it's a Suez scenario in the sense that when that happened, the, it was clear that the US and the USSR were there to sort of take over as two competing superpowers. If in 1956. Defeat, right. If China defeated us in a war, in a war for Taiwan, we would still be the second most powerful country in the world at that point. Congratulations to us. So our power would not evaporate immediately. Um, but we would certainly no longer be able to call ourselves the world's dominant power. That that period would would end. And you know, there are good reasons to think China won't actually do it. Um, but it's, it's certainly something but those, that those good reasons do not include American strategic insight and political resolve. I mean, there has been some under You're both the Trump Chinese and Biden, there has been some recalibration where we have moved more military assets to East Asia and tried to essentially refocus our defense and diplomatic efforts. This is what you see with the submarine deal with the Australians. Like, I mean, there, we are doing some things. We're not just sort of sitting as, you know, acting like this is sleepwalking into, into disaster. Um, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's a real military challenge and it's hard to know for certain what the current, what the actual balance of power in such a conflict, military power, I mean, between the U S and China would be. Kim, Kim, back to you on this China segment for two reasons. And I'm hoping that you, I'm hoping you can end this segment on an optimistic note for two reasons. The first, of course, is that this is meant to be a chipper and cheerful and year in review program. And the second is that if you don't, I'm going to get an email from Ross, the author of the decadent society saying, see, see, all right, Kim. <laughs> um, so again, I, I consider this much more an issue of the current administration. Look, the, the moment at which the uh, Chinese, uh, entire Chinese establishment rubbed their hands and said, oh, goody, was the day that Joe Biden named John Kerry as his new climate envoy, because that sent the symbol, sing, signal that that was the number one thing they cared about. And, and until this administration makes a decision that it's going to have that uh, political fortitude. Uh, it needs to be signing a deal like the one it signed with Australia on those subs every week. You know, it needs to be uh, pursuing a new uh, TPP trade program that makes it very clear that China will be isolated uh, unless it changes its behavior. But it's not going to be doing any of these things. Uh, and if it, it is proceeding under the constant uh, imperative that it keep China on side so that we can all link arms and say that we have solved the global climate crisis, which, by the way, China is never going to agree to do anyway. So uh, but I, I am far less pessimistic than Ross that this is a long term problem. I think with the right administration and the right focus that you could certainly get that message out. Um, and I, I, I think that we do not need to be in decline. Thank you, Kim. Ross's rebuttal is taking place in his reaction shot at the moment. <laughs> okay. Eyebrow raised. Just, just right, that. right. Um, Roe and Dobbs. On December 1st, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments on the Mississippi law that bans abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. A brief clip of legal scholar John Yu on a recent Ricochet podcast. There's two remarkable things from the oral argument. One is no one defended Roe on the merits. The second one was Kavanaugh came out pretty much saying, 
I don't really believe in stare decisis that much, at least not for really important issues. He said, it wasn't really a question. He just said, here's a list of opinions right. that we overturned and everyone knew and realized it was great, starting with Brown versus Board of Education overturning Plessy. All right. So f- almost five decades after Roe versus Wade was decided, in two hours, most oral arguments are only an hour, in a two hour oral arguments before the Supreme Court, nobody defended Roe on the constitutional merits. And Justice Kavanaugh, who going into the oral arguments had been the justice everyone was wondering about, said in effect, if it was badly decided, we need to overturn it. Is that a correct reading, Kim? Yeah. I mean, it was remarkable for anyone. Were you as astonished as I was? was, The whole thing was astonishing because I certainly expected to have a couple of the justices go there. But like you said, no one defended it. Like the entire, I mean, even the liberal justices, most of their argument was, well, this is really ingrained at this point and it would be really terrible if we got rid of it. But from a constitutional perspective, because it's also true, it was a terrible decision um, that looks more terrible as we go along. You know, we've now seen Justice Blackmun's papers in which he sent that correspondence to his colleagues on the court saying, well, you know, this whole viability thing, it's just totally arbitrary. You know, I mean, like we could just as easily like it's, you know, we could do a trimester test, but it's all just totally arbitrary, Um, you know, and obviously inventing the right out of whole cloth um, and then putting this country as an aside into, you know, almost 50 years, as you said, of a pitted cultural war that has done nobody any good. So, but it it was something to watch. Ross, the the argument from, I don't know that anybody would call it settled law because the disputes about whether Roe was anything, was any good continue in the law schools across the country to this day. But Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor, most vocally, Justice Kagan seemed to me to be a little bit on the quiet side as if she was reserving room to maneuver in conference. But in any event, the three, the three liber- they all said in effect, right or wrong, this has been the law for almost half a century. Millions of people have made life decisions based on what this court did in 1973. You try to overturn that and you're going to place the legitimacy of this court, the entire political system under intense stress. We don't need to do it. What do you make of the argument? What do you think the justices will make of that argument, Ross? Well, I think the I mean, what's interesting is it's literally, literally that's the argument that was made in Casey, right? Yes. In the ruling that rewrote and then upheld Roe. Casey nineteen ninety two. Roe yes, seventy three. Casey ninety two. Right. So in so in Casey, the the justices led by Anthony Kennedy said, "Look, we ha- you know, we settled this. We have to, you know, you, you we we call all Americans to defer to this settlement by the Supreme Court, basically." And the fact, you know, the very fact that it is still a completely live issue that has literally dominated judicial politics ever since is, I think, evidence enough that 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 call has failed. And so it's sort of, you know, you're in effect, the court will undercut its legitimacy no matter what it does. Right. I mean, that's that's the reality. If you if you have you know, if you have a bad decision that's been law for a long period of time, either way, you know, what once you admit it, either you admit it's bad law and cut your losses and move on or you continue saying it's bad law and bleed credibility in a different way. Um, I, I, but I think to bring that to a sharper point, I think what's interesting is that what you might call the institutionalists on the conservative side, meaning the John G. Roberts, who did actually sort of float the idea of a kind of partial, a partial change to Roe in his questioning, and then Kavanaugh, who emphatically did not. And you could probably put Amy Coney Barrett in that group too. The institutionalists are, I think they probably understand themselves to be caught between two forms of pressure, right? There is there is the pressure that Breyer and Sotomayor evoked, the pressure that will only strengthen over the next few months and sort of the, you know, the American political establishment, which is very much in favor of Roe and very much doesn't want to see it overturn. Um, but then there's the pressure from within the conservative legal movement where 
you know, this is seen as kind of a make or break moment for the philosophy of originalism and the whole project of the Federalist Society, where a big chunk of American conservatism signed up for this somewhat abstract and, you know, theoretical vision of constitutional interpretation based on the promise that it would get decisions like this one right. And if for some reason you ended up with a decision where, you know, John Roberts and Elena Kagan bring Brett Kavanaugh around to basically uphold Roe one more time, the consequences on the right, the consequences for who the next conservative Supreme Court nominee will be, the consequences for the future of the Federalist Society, um, the, you know, the main conservative legal institution, all of those consequences will be pretty significant as well. So it's, again, there's no consequence-free way the judges, the justices can rule here. On The ruling won't come down until <clears throat> June. I, as I understand, the court can send it, give it to us anytime it wants to, but, everybody's, but everyone is expecting the court to hold it until June. It holds the most important decisions longest, so John Yu tells me. Dan Henninger had a really interesting piece. Speaking of consequences, I thought last week in the Wall Street Journal, would a Supreme Court decision sending abortion policy back to the states, that is to say, overturning Roe, would such a decision disrupt American politics? Yes. But it would prove to the American people that change is possible, if not in Washington, then in the states. So Dan Henninger argued that overturning Roe indicates in some basic way that the American Federalist project still functions, that Roe would change all kinds of issues where we've gotten taken it for granted that Washington makes the big decisions and then the states adjust themselves to Washington. And Dan argues this could change that. This could change a lot of things beyond abortion itself. Plausible, Kim? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, Ross was making that point. There are consequences here on either side of this. But and people are talking about all the, the horrible ramifications that would immediately happen. Um, and, you know, and, and you can bet, by the way, Democrats would run in the midterm elections on this. Uh, it would, at least in the short term, be a very powerful federal campaign for them. But in the long term, and it stuck, not just what you just said, Peter, allowing people to say, you know, we signed up for this project to, to really put our focus on getting good justices, textualist justices on the court, and it is bearing some fruits. So, I mean, look, the courts also heard a Second Amendment case for the mm -hmm. first time in a decade, uh, more than that, uh, which is a really big deal. But also... Think about how it would simply change abortion politics across the country. You know, right now you have all of these state legislatures, particularly in Republican states, but also in Democratic states that are constantly putting out messaging bills, you know, bills that they know cannot withstand the scrutiny of Roe v. Wade. And it leads to incredibly extreme politics where the debate is over the crazy rather than where can we meet in the middle? And would that have the potential to calm that down, to force legislators at the state level to once again be responsible and accountable and actually pass things that matter? I kind of love the idea of that. Um, and if we were to devolve more authority back to the states, we could see a more productive form of politics and more accountable politics at the state level. And this could be a first step. I'd like to think that. Ross, do you want to make a prediction? No, I'm really, I'm, I'm really unsure about. Oh, you what are. Happened. I mean, I, I think, I, I, that's part of what makes it interesting. I mean, I think, you know, the simplest thing you would say would be, you know, there will be some, some kind of pro-choice backlash and mobilization that makes it a helpful national issue for Democrats, and then you will have, essentially, over a four to six year period, a lot of battles in the states that will end up with you know, some number of states having the equivalent of what national abortion law is now, um, some percentage having restrictions, more restrictions after 12 weeks, and a much smaller number having either outright bans or some kind of heartbeat law. So that's, that's the pundits, the safe pundits prediction. But I, I really, you know, this issue just hasn't been litigated in normal politics in mm -hmm. so long. We don't know where intensity lies. I've been surprised the, the Texas law, the Texas heartbeat bill, um, has not produced the kind of political backlash for I have to, and political mobilization that I, that I, as someone who's pro-life, 
expected. Um, and I don't know if that's an indicator. Maybe it just, you know, maybe it just will look really different if you if you nationalize the issue. And I do think it may, you know, as much as I'd, I'd like Kim's scenario of revitalized federalism to be true, you, I think you could imagine this just ending up as something that is debated in DC constantly. But I just, I think it's important to stress our, or at least my deep uncertainty about putting an issue that was last debated in a totally different America, the America of like, you know, the America mm -hmm. of 1970, 1971. It's just a very different country. And I, I don't know what the debate will look like. Listen, we have to do a segment on the economy because we can't not. But can we keep it to about two minutes? Because I really want sure. to close on journalism, which I, which of course is what I really want to talk about. So let's just let's just whip through the economy, the most important issue to most people that could possibly exist. But we'll just whip through it. Um, inflation. Wall Street Journal, a couple last week, I guess. The Fed is behind the curve. Inflation is now persistent and very high. Prices in November rose six point eight percent in the last twelve months the most in decades. Uh, so you still have the administration, pieces of the administration, Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury, talking about, well, there's these are, these are temporary problems as we come back from COVID. Jerome Powell has backed away from calling it temporary. Transitory, I think, was the term he was using. It's clear, it's this weird thing where all the country says there's inflation and the Fed of all institutions doesn't want to hear about it. Usually it's the other way around. How bad is it? Does the Fed have the does it have the 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 mechanisms and the political will to address it? Let's Ross. I, I think the Fed probably has some mechanisms and some political will to address it, but it is also bound up in, it, it really is bound up in the weirdness of the COVID economy. And I think there are limits to some of what the Fed can do um, that, you know, that, that would, I mean, basically the Fed doesn't want to bring on a sudden recession, right? So the Fed can't, it, it's, it's not going to be Paul Volcker in the 1980s in response to this. It's going to act more gradually and necessarily. And so then you are sort of stuck to some extent. And, you know, the Biden administration is stuck to some extent, waiting and hoping that the supply chain issues and everything else that is still somewhat COVID driven normalize before the midterms get before the midterms arrive. So they hope. Kim? Yeah, except for I think the problem here, look, why do you have inflation? Inflation is always classically, it's a supply demand problem, right? Uh, you got too little supply of goods and services and too big of a demand from people. Um, now, some of this is obviously the Fed, it should have moved to pull some of that money back sooner. It didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's behind the curve. And that's one of the reasons the Fed always gets scared about inflation is because once it takes hold, it's much harder to rein it is and it is to make sure you don't get it in the first place. So that was a big mistake. Um, and some of this is, as Ross said, uh, supply chain constraints brought on by COVID and by a lot of people who have uh, pent up demand. But why do they have as much money as they have? Because the government's been handing it out to them hand over fist for the past 18 months. Uh, and wants to continue doing that with a, you know, three to five trillion dollar build back better bill, which is a real problem. Um, and you, you've also got people who are because of that money are being paid not to work. Um, and you have an administration that simply by its signals of what it would like to do with taxes and with regulation is causing businesses to pull back and not engage in the sort of expansion and supply that you need to come out of an inflation issue. This was what Ronald Reagan understood when he inherited Jimmy Carter's inflation. If you wanna fix the supply demand imbalance, you gotta increase the supply side. And this administration's doing everything opposite of what you would need to do to get that under control. Mm. Although the first thing Ronald Reagan did was accept a recession. He backed Paul Volcker when Volcker jammed on the brakes on the money That's supply. Right. That's right. And interest rates went through the sea. All right. Um, by the way, could, really quickly, because I want to get to journalism and have some fun with it. Prediction on the Build Back Better bill. I see that Joe Manchin's approval ratings in West Virginia are roughly double those of Joe <laughs> Biden. Is Build Back Better going to make it through the Senate or is that bill dead? Ross, what do you think? 
I think it's more likely to be dead than Democrats think right now, but I guess I still give it, I still give it a 60% chance of something passing. Kim? Yeah, well, in, unless you can climb into Joe Manchin's head, you can't give an accurate prediction here, but I, it really I think- It does come that, down to him. Yeah, yeah, the double whammy of that inflation report that we just had, um, but also that CBO score, sorry to be inside baseball, <laughs> but that uh, Congressional Budget Office score that was finally honest about the real costs of this thing. If you were to extend out those provisions, those are the two things Joe Manchin cares about and, and they, they can't have helped this situation. All right, last questions. From 1979 to 1989, take in, get in mind that one decade, this country went from stagflation and the national humiliation of the Iranian hostage crisis to an economic boom and victory in the Cold War with the fall of the Berlin Wall. One decade. Is this country capable of another such act of self-renewal? Ross? I mean, does it sure. need it? Does it in, need theory, it? I'm in, in, in theory, yes, yes. Um, and there are, you know, things at work in American life that are positive signs. The fact that we developed vaccines for COVID in record time. The fact that, you know, I think the, the fact that our billionaires are engaging in a kind of space race is a good positive sign for the United States of America. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't close the door on that kind of renewal. I think there are a lot of the, the place where I would be most optimistic is in sort of certain areas of technology, where I think a lot of people think we're on the cusp of some real transformations that could drive a lot of economic growth. So th those are reasons for optimism. To be pessimistic, you know, America in 1980 was a much younger country than we are today. Our political system was less polarized. It was possible for Ronald Reagan to get elected and get a lot of Democrats to vote for his legislation. Um, and honestly, I think overall, the effect of the internet on American social life and political life has been largely negative. And I, I don't know, I don't know what the fix is for that. Um, and it makes me somewhat pessimistic about that part of the American future right now. And I, Kim, I saved you for seconds so that you could bring us up. Bring us up. <laughs> so going to the perpetual optimist. Yes, absolutely. Of course we are. <laughs> you know why? Because we did it five years ago. You know, I mean, maybe not uh, to that stunning of a degree, but, you know, whatever you thought of Donald Trump, his personal behavior, and I understand why, you know, Ross had real issues. I, I had issues with a lot of his behavior in office. He put together an extraordinary uh, administration, cabinet officials, most of whom, by the way, were recruited from by Mike Pence, who would, had been deeply ensconced in uh, the policy world for many years. Do you know that, and people forget this, by the, the end of the Trump administration's first year, the, the Federal Register, which is that list of all the rules and regulations in Washington, was down to the size it had been when Bill Clinton was last in office. I mean, that's just a remarkable statistic. It can, so it shows it can be done. Tax reform, um, all the policies that you saw across that. And look at those numbers that we had on the employment uh, right before COVID hit. It was working. Things were getting better for a lot of people. So um, it, it's a question of policy. I agree that there are cultural aspects that make it a little harder. There's polarization, divided. Uh, we have new technology. Um, but, you know, we, we also have a habit of, of saying, oh, well, things have never been worse or more challenging uh, now uh, than ever before. And in fact, we have had even more challenging times in uh, America's history, too. So I think this country has again and again proven its ability to triumph in the face of a lot of uh, challenges. And I'm, I'm not convinced that we're in any way done doing that yet. Last question. Last question. I thought the last one was that the was last. The la one. That was the last. No, I told a lie. Either. This is really <laughs> the last question. Now, this I want to end it on journalism because I've got two of the most brilliant journalists in the country, and both of you started as babies. A month ago, I visited Hanover, New Hampshire, my alma mater, Dartmouth College, and I spent an evening with the kids on the staff of the Dartmouth Review, the conservative, more or less conservative student newspaper. So this is two and a half dozen kids. And in the course of the conversation, I said, how many of you want to go into journalism? Zero. Not a single hand went up. Now, what do you say to kids about 
well, actually, you ought to think about this, Kim. Well, or do you, you not say that? Do you just say, go make money in tech? No, I mean, I guess it's what your ambitions are. Look, I think if it is your ambition to go make money in tech, then then obviously follow your ambition. But if you are politically oriented or issue oriented, or you care deeply about uh, you know civics in the country, that is traditionally often what pulled people into journalism too. The idea that you would make a difference, right? Um, now, over the years, I think that unfortunately our journalism programs have come to define making a difference as liberal causes. Uh, you know, go be a journalist and uh, and, you know, you can save the planet or save the environment or, you know, right injustice or go after the police department. But there used to be a day when simply journalism was seen as a, an outlet to, to, to get truth out there. Um, in a way that was fundamental to the workings of the American society. And that still is the case. In fact, there's even more opportunity these days because of, and then the other thing too is this is your chance to go. And I understand why many people might not want to go into a profession that is held in such low regard by so many Americans, but this is in fact your opportunity to change that by being a good journalist and um, you know showing it can still be done. Ross? I think the reality is that what a lot of people see in journalism is a combination of, you know, well, just, just a basic reality that it's an industry in decline. And that is actually true. Um, that, you know, in, in the press, we like to joke that, you know, the only, <laughs> the only industry worse is becoming an English PhD. <laughs> Right. So definitely, definitely don't do that. But yeah, I mean, what what <laughs> journalism, what journalism has become is a place where there are fewer comfortable jobs available than there used to be. Um, and and that that's just the truth. And there's no point, I think, in telling students or people interested in the profession otherwise. That said, it's also and in certain ways more than ever a place where if you have distinctive ideas and distinctive talents and are willing to sort of be eccentric and do strange things and go places where other people aren't willing to go and talk to people that other people aren't willing to talk to, you can be incredibly good at it and have an amazing life and career. Um, so if you're looking for a placid life and a way to sort of, you know, write, do some good and write, write stories and so on, there, there is less opportunity than there used to be. But if you're the kind of person who would only be satisfied being a journalist, you definitely should become a journalist because uh -huh. there's still a lot of great work to be done. Kim Strassel of the Wall Street Journal and Ross Dowlett of the New York Times, two people who hold a couple of the few remaining truly comfortable seats in American journalism <laughs> and who amazingly enough are so good that they actually deserve them. Kim and Ross, thank you very much. And Merry Thanks, Christmas. Peter. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson.